Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. Today, I'll be joined in studio with my colleagues, Dr. Scott Stripling and Scott Lancer, in a roundtable discussion about the exodus from Egypt. We'll be discussing amazing archaeological discoveries that confirm and uphold the biblical account. We hope you enjoy the program. Well, we're talking today, guys, about, again, about the early date of the Exodus. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Exodus is this central event in the Bible that uh, the Old Testament uh, saints and the New Testament saints all looked back at it. Uh, and, and it was central to the, uh, the, the historical development mm -hmm. in Scripture connected to salvation, mm -hmm. God delivering his people, and of course, that, that whole account is, is, is central to our understanding of God's revelation. Um, the, the Exodus being this critical event, it's important for us to, to try to accurately date it. And of course, we've talked in previous episodes about the biblical data, the, the, those key um, chronological markers in mm -hmm. Scripture that point us to understand when that event occurred. Um, we want to talk today about some of the archaeological data. Now, I want to make sure for our viewers, again, we always have to kind of go back and, and remind everyone that we don't place archaeology above the Bible. This is why we start with Scripture. This is why mm -hmm. we look at the biblical data. But then we look at the archaeology. And, of course, we're, we're involved in archaeology. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what we're called to do. We're looking at archaeology, and we want to help God's people understand the text of the Bible well. So we'll look at archaeology now. And we're going to connect these. We're going to connect the scriptures with the, the archaeological information. And we hope that everyone watching will be blessed and encouraged. And we hope it'll bring everyone a greater understanding of the text of the Bible. Well, we want to begin today uh, talking about Avaris. Mm. Now, Avaris, we probably need to tell everybody just where that is and, and give them a little uh, understanding of that. But we're going to talk about the abandonment. Mm phase, the abandonment phase mm -hmm. at Avaris, and maybe, Henry, we can start with you adding Well, a few yeah, sure. I'll, I'll set up the biblical context, right? We've got the Israelites in the Egyptian delta, the land of Goshen. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis 47, 11 says this is where they settled. Uh, they were there for several centuries, and then they departed at the time of Moses. So uh, the land that they're in, the... the um, is in the delta. It's near the uh, one of the branches of the of the of the Nile mm -hmm. River. So it's not in a desert mm -hmm. as it's often portrayed, but it's in this rich, beautiful land. And we've got tons of archaeology <clears throat> that's been uh, uh, discovered in this area that fits right into this period. Mm -hmm. And so, Scott, we'll kick it over to you to start from there and uh, talk about this mm -hmm. important information. Okay. So why, why does this matter? Um, we looked at six biblical passages that all pointed us to the middle of the 15th century, which would be the 18th Egyptian dynasty. That's pretty overwhelming. And so you would think if someone's going to take a date other than that date, they must have really strong archaeological evidence if it's going to trump that. Where does the archaeological evidence point? Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to see is, in fact, it also lines up in the 15th century B.C. And so we begin at Avaris with an Austrian archaeologist by the name of Manfred Bietak. And Manfred Bietak is <clears throat> widely seen as one of the top five archaeologists of this generation. He's a man of tremendous stature. I do not know what his faith commitments are. He's certainly uh, not an evangelical by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, he's been working since 1990 in the Egyptian Delta at a site called Tel El Daba. This would be what was ancient Avaris or biblical Ramesses. And so most people on all sides of these discussions would, would see that connection, that Ramesses was located at uh, Avaris, and Avaris goes by now the modern name of, of Tel El Daba. Daba. Okay? Yeah. So he uncovered a palatial district there. And this is really interesting because uh, prior to this, people had said that only Memphis was occupied and was a governmental seat at this time. And so when Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron and they come in that same night, they arrive to the palace. If it's at Memphis, how is that possible? You know, the Bible mm -hmm. doesn't seem to have verisimilitude, they would say. Well, once again, after Betak's work in 1990, you can see that there was another palatial district uh, that existed at that time on the Pelusiac uh, branch of the Nile. 
Now, to your question about the uh, abandonment at, mm -hmm. at Avaris, uh, this is exactly what Betak found, that in the middle of the 15th century, which would be the 18th dynasty, that there is a very clear abandonment phase at this majorly important site on this, this branch of the Nile. So it's a very important site. Logically, it makes no sense to abandon it. What happened there? Well, there was clear evidence in the stratum beneath this abandonment phase, what he has labeled as stratum uh, C1 to D. This is um, clearly Semitic mm -hmm. evidence, mm -hmm. okay? You've got Semites that are living there, and there is an animal burial that's dug into the abandonment phase. In this, this animal burial, which is kind of interesting why people bury different animals at different times, we know the Egyptians are venerating different animals as being sacred, but the pottery in this, this phase that's dug in, this, this locus, if you will, that's dug into the abandonment phase, mm -hmm. uh, you have no pottery from the Amarna period, no pottery from the Ramesside period. It clearly dates to the reign of Amenhotep II. Interesting. Mm -hmm. so, in, <clears throat> so in this abandonment phase, at Avar of, of, first of all, going back, if I recall correctly, Avaris was an important, uh, a palace has been found there, large structures, and it was a military site from which some of the um, na the navy was launched. Is that correct? Or That's the army correct. was lost? Yes. Uh, launched. So very important in terms of uh, its location and usage. Right. right. Oh, it's very critical. Very right. Strategic. Very critical. Right. Very strategic. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, boom, there's an abandonment. So right at the time that the Exodus is dated, approximately. Well, the, the six passages that we looked at all right. well, put we it at that same it. time right. that now we have right. a very... Um, non-biased source in yeah. BTOC saying that we've got an archaeological phase that seems to be matching that. Interesting. And, in, yeah. and then the culture, the material culture, is not Egyptian per se. No, it's different. It's different. It's people from Canaan. Right. They're Asiatics. Is, they we call is them Asiatic. They, as, they refer to uh, Canaan as retinue. As retinue. Is that, is that, mm -hmm. is that right? Uh, so, so they're pe foreigners yes. living there. That's right. Now, what does the Bible say about who's living there at this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Foreigners are living there. Foreigners are living there. And there's a great number of them. Mm -hmm. they're, they're Asiatics. Asiatics. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the word that's used in the so, literature. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing, uh, the, the correlation there. Well, uh, what people hear th uh, about Goshen, right? That's the mm -hmm. word that commonly is used. Right. And we're <laughs> talking about this area where the, it, the Israelites would have lived. And we're just connecting the dots here now. And this is a great, a great example of this, this discovery of BTEC. He wasn't trying to find the Israelites. No. But wow. Well, so just to clarify, what he found <laughs> was an abandonment phase mm -hmm. beneath that. His uh, uh, strata D1 to C yeah. is clearly Semitic, okay? Mm -hmm. And this population then disappears around mm -hmm. the time that the biblical exodus occurred from what right, we saw from right. our sources that we've looked at. So it, I would say BTAC did three important things. Uh, number one, he identified the palatial district there, which ties in, as I mentioned, with uh, Moses and Aaron being summoned. Mm -hmm. He documented the abandonment phase, which is very interesting. And by the way, those, those animal burials in D dug in, interesting animals. You've got uh, hippopotami and, and crocodiles and various mm -hmm. animals that are sort of amphibian, mainly, yeah. that are being venerated there, which I guess makes sense on the Nile. Um, and then thirdly, he dealt with the issue of carbon dating. And this is bigger than we can explore, but I'll just mention it in passing that he's noted a, a, an offset in the carbon dating at this time, beginning at this abandonment phase, that it no longer matches as you go further back in history. It's not matching the other metrics. So up to this point, the pottery matches the carbon dating, the glyptic mm -hmm. remains match the carbon dating, the things that we would normally historically use to, to date a site. But from here, it begins to stray, and this becomes very important because when we start trying to date the exodus and conquest uh, and using carbon as a, as a metric, yeah. mm -hmm. that's problematic when we get to a site like Jericho. So yeah. not to go down that rabbit trail, but I'll just say he does, he does three important things at Tel Eldaba. Yeah. Yes. So yes. there's a conflict between what the historians, archaeologists say, and what the scientists say in yes. terms of dates in this period. 
So we'll have, maybe we'll cover that some other time. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's but, a whole but, subject unto itself. But it shows you how yeah. we've got to grapple with all this data and sh and try to show which points to the where the data leads best. Absolutely. I guess is how you would say it. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. In our first segment, we were discussing archaeological evidence related to the biblical account of the Exodus. We'll be picking up on this discussion again with Dr. Scott Stripling and Scott Lancer. We hope you enjoy it. Well, let's move on to uh, this uh, uh, great stone inscription. Uh, Sinai 375A as a kind of intimidating uh, <laughs> title for that, but uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Well, one of the founders of archaeology, uh, Flinders Petrie, or his full name, Sir Matthew William Flinders Petrie, mm -hmm. uh, quite the eccentric and quite the Egyptologist, uh, he's really the one who gave us clear understanding of stratigraphy and ceramic typology at Tel El Hesse but he made several important discoveries in Egypt as well. So in 1905, he is at a place called Serabet el Khavim in the southwestern Sinai, and he discovers this inscription. So, I mean, to the untrained eye, it just looks like scratches on a, on a stone, but an epigraphist, of course, can do a lot with this. And our colleague, Doug Petrovich, has recently published a book on Hebrew as the world's oldest alphabet, and one of the pieces of evidence that he deals with is Sinai 375a. And so we'll just touch on it uh, today, but essentially what it appears to show is, is a transition from the Proto-Sinaitic script or uh, from the, the, the cuneiform hieroglyphic script into a pre-alphabetic type mm -hmm. script, if you will. So you take, for example, the ox head and mm -hmm. it begins to take the shape of an aleph in the Hebrew alphabet. Mm -hmm. So following this through then, Petrovich has identified Sinai 375 and translated it and uh, it's in the process of in the academic community everyone's hashing through what yes, you know if they yeah. agree or disagree and to what to what uh, levels but basically what it says is the overseer of minerals Ahisamak. Now Ahisamak is a name that we know from Exodus 31 and Exodus 38 along with Bezalel he's the one who built the tabernacle now, needless to say, we're very interested in the tabernacle because right, of our work right, at Shiloh. Right. Well, the Bible tells us who built it. We have someone here who is an overseer of minerals, which when you read the Exodus 31 passage, this is what his, his father was involved in, overseeing minerals. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, his son apprentices under him, and that just fits perfectly with the timing of the Exodus because we might mm -hmm. date this to around 1480, so then the son being chosen by God to, to build the yeah. tabernacle fits really, really nicely. So that's what the vertical script reads, and then the horizontal script, Petrovich translates it as, the one having been elevated is weary to forget. If he's right in his, in his reading of this, this is pretty astonishing because this gives us a direct synchronism with a biblical character from the Exodus noted outside the Bible. Yeah. From the 15th mm -hmm. century. And, in, and, mm -hmm. and you said this is the southwest Sinai? Southwestern Sinai. So this is near, is this the turquoise mines? Yes, near the turquoise mines. Right, right. <laughs> and and uh, so the Egyptians were very interested in mining there. And that means some Semites were there. Right. Probably as maybe slave labor or, or sure. perhaps in charge of something, <clears throat> in depending the 18th, on when it was. In the New Kingdom, which is dynasties 18 through 20, they're yeah. mining heavily in this area. And they're yeah. using slave labor to do it, yeah. which is, of course... The Israelites. Yeah, mm -hmm. fascinating. fascinating. So, uh, an interesting piece of evidence, and we'll see how, how it all plays out. Yeah, and in ABR's bookstore, we have a DVD of Doug presenting some of this. 
so our audience could could really hear Doug talk about it in mm -hmm. great detail, yes, uh, yes. and they can get that on our ABR website. Okay. All right, Scott, just 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 remind and maybe clarify for our our, our um, those watching today. Uh, how does this connect with the early date of the of the Exodus? All right, so if that epigraphically. Mm -hmm. If that inscription is dated to around 1480, mm -hmm. that's 15th century BC. And then uh, the son, this is Ahisamak the father. So then the son, a holy a generation later, take 25 years off of that, and boom, that's right in the sweet spot for the Exodus, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the mid 15th century, which is the same time that we've been looking at on all of our other metrics. Okay, good, good. That's that's a yep. fits a again good another summary. data point that fits perfectly in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. All right, now, one of the great discoveries was the Armarna tablets, and, and um, I would assume maybe uh, uh, many of our viewers may have heard of this, but if not, why are the Armarna tablets important, and where do they fit into this whole conversation? Well, we have a peasant woman digging for fertilizer in uh, Tel Aviv, Armarna, <laughs> Egypt, and there you instead go. she starts digging up cuneiform tablets. Don't you hate it when you're digging for fertilizer yep. and you come up with cuneiform tablets? And the cuneiform tablets All right, are so the wedge-shaped letters yeah, on clay. About the shape of my size of my hand. It's clay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Akkadian is the language, but the the lettering system is yep. cuneiform. Yes. So yes. yeah, you get a cuneiform tablets, and so mm -hmm. there's 382 of them that are recovered, mm -hmm. and these are referred to as the Amarna letters, or tablets. Yes. It's a series of correspondence between Canaanite city-states and Pharaoh back in Egypt. It dates, very interestingly, <clears throat> to, I would say, about 1370 uh, B.C., maybe 1366, or somewhere in that decade, give or take a few years. So right. my date would be 1370 for the Amarna letters. Now, why does this matter? Well, what are these uh, rulers of these Canaanite city-states saying, like Megiddo and Shechem and Jerusalem in particular, they are crying out to Pharaoh back in Egypt to send help. Mm -hmm. Send us archers, send us support, or we won't be able to pay our tribute to you anymore. We're trying to be loyal <laughs> to Pharaoh, but we are being overrun by a group of foreigners, a group of Habiru. H-A-B-I-R-U, of course the, the vowels we insert, it's the, the consonants that are consistent. Yeah. Yeah. So the HBR. Yeah. We're being overrun by these HBR. HBR. The, they're coming, they're <laughs> just mm -hmm. swarming upon us. They're yes. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, what are we going to do with these HBR? Well, of course, uh, much has been written about this, but it seems to me very clear that these are the Hebrews, the biblical mm -hmm. Hebrews. Yeah. Now, Habiru is a broader term. It can, it can mean nomads or marauders in a broader sense. But the ones that are overrunning Canaan at the time that the Bible puts the Israelites mm -hmm. uh, yes. in, the, in the conquest are clearly, I believe, the biblical Hebrews. Yes. Yeah, it make, it, uh, it's always made total sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in Canaan and you're writing a letter to the king and you want to describe these people who have come into your land, that's the term you would use. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say, if the Israelites were coming in the land, according to our model, how would you describe them? You would describe them as foreign invading marauders, right. Abiru. It's, it absolutely fits. It nails the, it. The other mm -hmm. part of it is the political structure of Canaan is just fractured into all these little king states, city states. That's exactly how they're described in the book of Joshua. Hmm. Joshua conquered 31 kings, the king, of, the king of Megiddo, the king of this, the king of that, the king, 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 all the way down. So it's accurately describing the political conditions in Canaan that right. are found in the Amarna letters. Yeah. So, real quickly, because I know we've got another piece to cover, um, Pharaoh never responds, or at least we don't have any record of it. Yeah. We yeah. do have, just published four years ago or five years ago by Elat Mazar, uh, in her dig at the Ophel, just south of the Temple Mount, she found a fragment of a cuneiform tablet, and it appears to be an archival copy of one of the Amarna letters. Oh, interesting. So, 286 and 287 are sent by Abdi Heba, the king of Jerusalem. Now, some would tell you Jerusalem was uninhabited in the late Bronze Age because the archaeology is so sparse, yet we have written sources, the Amarna letters, saying there's a king and that it is inhabited. Yes. So, 286 and 287, it appears to be a piece of one of those. So, they've kept an archival copy even though it never is really uh, really answered. So I think the presence of these Habidu in those first decades of the 14th century is very important because that does not at all fit with a late date for the Exodus, but it synchronizes beautifully 
with, with what we have. So an initial conquest followed by decades uh, and even centuries yeah. of, of, of conquest. Yeah, in the late date, the political structure of Canaan has changed. That's right. So it doesn't, it doesn't really fit very well at all. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to our third segment of Digging for Truth, where I've been discussing archaeological discoveries with my colleagues, Dr. Scott Stripling and Scott Lancer, about the events in the book of Exodus, those momentous events surrounding the life of Moses and the people of Israel. We hope you enjoy this last segment. Well, let's talk about the soul of hieroglyph. Uh, again, uh, giving us important insights into the dating here, and let's talk about that. Well, um, this is outside of modern Egypt, but it would be in Nubia, and uh, it's a, a site called Soleb. Mm -hmm. And Amenhotep III is uh, building temples, and one of his temples is built at this place called Soleb. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very interesting because there is an inscription there, a hieroglyphic inscription, and the inscription refers to the land of the Shasu of Yahweh. Now, Shasu is a term similar to Habidu. Mm -hmm. It means nomadic marauders or whatever. So it's a, a, a broader sense. But mm -hmm. when you want to narrow it, you say the Shasu of Yahweh. So you mean that in the time of Amenhotep III, which is the 14th century, early 14th century, right. you have a land of foreign marauders yeah. who worship a monotheistic god named Yahweh. No way. It's just incredible synchronism. Yeah. yeah. And, and most of the time when the Shasu are referred to, they're referred to a place. Here it's the the, the people of, Yah right. uh, of uh, Yah Yahweh. Right. And so that's a pretty extraordinary thing. They, it's almost like they didn't know what to call them. It's an awareness <laughs> of monotheistic groups. I mean, we know from yes. Akhenaten there yeah. was a concept of monotheism, but yeah. the Egyptians are aware that there's other people in other lands who worship Yahweh. So yes, Amenhotep yeah. III is, is Akhenaten, right? They're one and the same. No, that's the fourth. Oh, oh that's the fourth. fourth. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. But we're talking about this time period right. uh, around, the, uh, around the time of the Amarna letters? Yes. Uh, right. So we go back to the Amarna letters. The, the Solob hier hieroglyph, Shasu of Yahweh, also, same time, yes. mentions the Israelite God. And so try to squeeze that into a late date. Okay, it doesn't you work. Yeah, you can't, you can't uh, do it, right? It I doesn't mean, work. Yeah. No, so what we have here with the uh, Solab hieroglyph, with the Amarna letters, with the, uh, the abandonment phase at Avaris, all of this is, is coming together as archaeological evidence that matches the biblical text that we've looked at. Yeah, now this, this uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, the approach that we... we I should try to phrase it, phrase it this way. Uh, I, I love the term, Dr. Wood has always used this, the matrix of evidence. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of, you know, you take one data point, well, you might be able to sort of find a way mm -hmm. to uh, explain your way out of it, or it's not enough. You know, it's almost like a courtroom case, if you, if you could say mm -hmm. it that way. You put it on the scale. You got Amarna letters, Solo hieroglyph. Sinai 375A. You know, and, and you just keep sort of piling on, right. and before you know it, you're kind of going, okay, well, I can't prove it. I don't have a, you know, a videotape of it, as it were. But you're, you're, you're getting, you're, you're moving in that direction. And with archaeology, that's, that's about the, the best you can ask for because we don't have direct access to the past. Mm -hmm. We have indirect access, but the access is pretty awesome. Well, it is, and as we're going to see in the next segment, there's more to come. Okay? Yeah, there's so a lot more to come. In, in this yeah. segment, we looked at four pieces of archaeological evidence. Yeah. In the next segment, we're going to look at four more 
pieces of archaeological evidence. And that, that scale has, has yeah. tilted very considerably now to the 15th century yeah. BC. It's going to tilt even further. And let me yeah. just remind the, the viewers why this matters. We want to excavate and understand our stratification. So to understand the stratum in which we're locating, excavating, is extremely important. We're interested in texts from Egypt, we're interested in texts from Mes Mesopotamia, and we're interested in the biblical text, of course, like we would any other ancient text. Mm -hmm. To understand how that synchronizes chronologically is critically important. And so we don't want to be looking in the wrong place and the wrong time, time, or we'll certainly find the wrong stuff. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Digging for Truth. We talked about amazing discoveries related to the Exodus. The abandonment of Avaris, the Amarna letters, and the inscription with the name of Yahweh. These are powerful evidences for the reliability of the Bible. We'll be talking more about these amazing discoveries in our next episode, so please join us at that time. Thank you for watching.